Good afternoon. Welcome to the Korea Society. Welcome to Studio Korea and welcome to the Samsung Center. It is our pleasure today to continue the series, The Analyst. Uh, we're halfway through the series and today we welcome Dr. Sue Terry, uh, known for uh, all of her excellent work in writing for her work at Columbia University uh, with Gerson Global Advisors uh, and Previously, her work for the uh, National Intelligence Office for the National Security Council for the Central Intelligence Agency, and Sue is a graduate of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Sue, welcome. We're delighted to have you here you. at the Korea Society. And uh, we are joined today by a uh, marvelous, uh, intimate audience. I'd like to acknowledge a few members of our board who are here today. Uh, Dr. Kim Young-duk, uh, Y.D. Kim, thank you for coming. Uh, Lee Snyder. And Rudd Potts, thank you very much for your joining us today. And Ambassador Hom, the Deputy Permanent Representative uh, from the Republic of Korea to the United Nations, thank you for honoring us with your presence and all of you for taking time here on this noon hour to listen to Sue and her observations on something that has become very hot again in dialogue, and that is the emphasis on unification going forward. Uh, this year has been an interesting one in that uh, Korean President Park Geun-hye uh, started early in the year by talking about the notion of a unification bonanza. Uh, Sue captured quite a bit of attention uh, through foreign affairs and an important piece called A Korea Whole and Free. And we'll talk about that piece. We'll talk about some of the reaction to it. Uh, and then we have this new presidential committee uh, for unification preparation, which is uh, had two meetings to date in Korea, uh, which is establishing a framework uh, which will be visiting New York City through some of its representatives. And so there's a currency to this dialogue that is interesting and one that the Korea Society is very much supportive of. So Sue, welcome and congratulations on the piece Thank and you. all the attention you've gotten from it. Um, could you guide us through a bit in terms of uh, the piece and your approach? Uh, sure. Well, first, thank you, Stephen, and thank you to the Korea Society for inviting me here today. Um, it's a privilege to be here, always a pleasure. You've done a marvelous job with this program, oh, thank so thank you so much. Um, before I talk about the piece, I wonder if I could just sort of talk about something that's my approach and so sure, just please. basic thing about North Korea. Um, as you mentioned, I spent my entire adult life and most of my career following North Korean issues. and spent 12, 13 years at the CIA as a North Korea analyst monitoring North Korea with all available intelligence information. Um, and then spent some time at the policy side and now in academia interacting with renowned Korea watchers and debating and discussing. And I can tell you one thing with certainty about North Korea, and that is we know very little about what really goes on at the leadership level mm. and regime intentions level. I mean, we know sh reshuffling and who's doing what, but the real dynamics under I with the leadership. And I mentioned this because I want to say something before I talk about the unification is that no one knows the timeline for when mm. that's going to happen. And um, so I have, I'm not saying that regime implosion is about to happen or the unification is about to happen. No one knows that. But that said, because we know so little about North Korea, and I don't care who you are, we don't. I mean, we can only speculate. So that said, while Kim Jong-un regime and this North Korean state can last another 50 years, 40 years, 30 years, and I just don't know when the timeline is, I would not be surprised either if it were to fall apart tomorrow, or six months from now, or a year from now, because all the conditions for potential instability have been there, um, and you know that. So all the pillars of stability, what kept the regime going, have been eroding for some time, and no one can deny that either, right? And what are some of these pillars of stability? We talk about elite loyalty or support, because the leadership really needs the elite support, not the populist elite support. Mm -hmm. um, information, monopoly on information, and ideological indoctrination, uh, whether it's foreign assistance or security service, we have these pillars of stability. All of them have been eroding. I mean, we just even know, let's talk about the elite loyalty support. Kim Il-sung had elite loyalty. Kim Jong-il had what we call elite support. I try to differentiate between mm -hmm. loyalty and support because sure. it's a, it has a different nuance, right? 
And yes, Kim Jong Un seems like he he has he's he has some support, at least support, because obvious obviously elites have vested interest in keeping the status quo, in keeping the system going. Their their fate is locked with Kim Jong Un. But there's it's not the kind of loyalty that we've seen before, and it's not. And even the support—I mean, there's a lot going on under the lid. I think Chang Song Tech's execution and all the reshuffling that's been going on at least show us that there's so much that we don't know, and there's something is going on there. And we can at least question whether there's elite unity. There's definitely disunity going on, right, with Chang Song Tech's execution. And even today, we just heard that somebody else has been executed from the. Um, so, while my only point is that. I would not be surprised. So my point of the Foreign Affairs article is this, that first of all, because we know very little, and it could happen, mm-hmm. North Korea is undoubtedly the world's most failed state. And historical record shows that failed states cannot last forever. So at some point, this is going to happen. We just don't know when. So my point of the article was, let's f- focus on preparing Full disunification, which is so important. Yes, we do have military plans in place. U.S. has military plan to um, respond to a conflict with North Korea, war scenario. South Korea obviously has plans to even deal with North Korea in case of regime implosion. But we don't have the kind of plan, a comprehensive plan, that legal, economic, diplomatic plan to complement the military plan. And we need to get going on that because we don't know when it's going to, when it's going to happen. And another point that I was trying to make on, uh, with the article was that I'm not trying to minimize the challenges and the consequences or put all the potential problems that's, that unification will entail or regime implosion or regime collapse um, or the consequences of negative consequences of that potential scenario. I'm not trying to minimize that either. I spent majority of my time when I was working in the government looking at these, all the things that could go wrong. But I've also I've been feeling that because of all this overfocus and all the things that could go wrong, right? Humanitarian disaster, potential refugee flows, um, what we're going to do about the Korean People's Army, potentially loose nukes. Uh, there are a lot of things that could go wrong. But we haven't really spent time looking at the flip side of it, which is that I'm not denying all these challenges in the immediate and short, even medium term, but what's going to happen in the long term? Mm -hmm. And that's what I think this is when I was bringing up some potential benefits of unification. Um, Never mind humanitarian benefit, number one, freeing 25 million North Korean people Mm -hmm. from the grip of the last remaining Stalinist dictatorship. We don't talk enough about human rights. But what about these people? So th- we, that's immeasurable, that benefit alone, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 80 to 120,000 political prisoners that are now sitting in the gulags, freeing these people, um, literally um, you know, uh, moving them out of this starvation diet, right? Literally and sure. intellectually out of this um, uh, food shortages and too plentiful avail- availability of food and information and consumer goods and other benefits of um, modern capitalism. So besides the humanitarian benefit, we all know about the security benefit. North Korea is the biggest potential for instability in Northeast Asia. We have so many concerns about North Korea proliferates everything under the planet. We don't have evidence that they have proliferated nuclear technology, but that's a concern. So obviously, we're eliminating the biggest source for uh, potential instability. And then economic benefits, you know, you've been hearing about these uh, potential economic benefits that a unified Korea would be, uh, could be even more prosperous over the long term, right? We're talking about, and we can go through the list of that, right? Um, defense spending. Right now, South Korea spent 35, its budget is $35 uh, billion this year, um, but the reduced defense spending, uh, conscription, that's mandatory conscription that's in South Korea, that they could be, these young men could be freer, earlier join the, the economy. Uh, the natural resources, not, North Korea is sitting, sitting on um, $6 trillion, estimated $6 tri- trillion worth of um, natural resources. South Korea, meanwhile, imports 97% mm. of its natural resources because they don't have any. Um, 
so the, the list is long in terms of and the labor. South Korea is the fastest aging society, uh, second fastest, age, fast, fastest aging society in the world. Um, it's, its life expectancy rate, which is about 81 years old right, old right now, it's, um, it's, they're living longer now, which is a good thing. I want South Koreans mm -hmm. to live longer. But it's a fast aging society. We have a rel relatively younger la uh, labor workforce in North Korea. So there's pot potential benefits. Um, and we, we, you know, you've seen that report about Golden Sex report in 2009 talking about how potentially unified Korea be could become in the next Germany of Asia. Um, and you know, a lot of people sort of nitpick at this economic argument, but I don't underestimate the Korean people. After the Korean War, Korean Peninsula was completely devastated. In the early 60s, it was one of the poorest countries on the planet. It was poorer than Sudan and Bangladesh, mm. Liberia. This is early 60s. And look what South Korea has accomplished. So I do believe in the Korean people. Um, it just, it will be 75 million hardworking pe people. Mm -hmm. uh, that's whole and free. Um, so again, I'm not trying to say there's all these upsides and there's no negative downsides. It's that we are going to certainly face a lot of challenges, and, but there are also going to be benefits. Mm -hmm. And besides, we might not have a choice in the matter. It's not like we can choose because out of all the potential scenarios of unification, soft landing scenario, which is what everybody wants, but frankly, Candidly, I don't think it's all that likely that we are now looking at North Korea that's going to change and really reform itself and become this uh, new country that its neighbors or uh, its citizens can live with. I just don't see that happening. So f far as I'm concerned, that's what we desire, but it's not necessarily most likely scenario. Or the other scenario of a unification through conflict or war. I also don't think that's necessarily a um, likely scenario either. So most likely scenario in my mind is this hard landing scenario, we don't, which we, don't, we can't choose. It will just implode one day and we'll have to deal with it. So it comes back to then my original point, which is we have to start preparing for unification. We need to talk, we need to get engaged with, obviously US and South Korea needs to have this comprehensive plan much more comprehensive than what it is. We need to start talking to the Chinese about this. China, it's, it's very hard to talk to the Chinese about this. We've tried. We understand the reasons why. China, while China is not happy with Kim Jong-un, while China is certainly, you know, there's no love lost there. They, were, they have not been happy with North Korea for some time. We know that. Kim Jong-un is yet to visit Beijing. Xi Jinping is yet to go to Pyongyang when Xi Jinping had two very successful summits with President Park. So while China is not happy with North Korea, we know that still their priorities with North Korea is to keep it as a buffer against potential US forces there, and we know that. So, but nonetheless, we have no choice but to in, try to engage with China, and that's where sort of the more controversial point about my piece came in, which is, you know, we could even try to offer a deal with the Chinese, which is that we know what your concerns are, Let's try to then, you know, make a make a deal and, you know, even promise that we might have to even withdraw all the U.S. troops, you know, case of unification. Because at the end of the day, we would have eliminated that threat, so we don't really need mm -hmm. to be there. Um, but that that's a little bit controversial. Um, but that was my bottom line: is that we need to start preparation. We need to and not fear unification. Um, that we you know, it's going to happen sooner or later. Yeah. And later might be even more problematic because what would happen is North Korea is continually building nuclear weapons. They're continually honing their technology um, and building more fissile material and producing more fissile material, nuclear material. And so sooner is better than later. And we got to do what we can to um, prepare for it. I think one of the interesting things with your piece, especially following on the statement by Pakane early in the year about this notion of unification benefits or bonanza and the historic Dresden speech where she outlined in Germany and Germany for its important symbolic representation 25 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, you know, a call that takes into account some of the economic, some of the social realities, cost, and how to mend yeah. those, and, and speaks to potential benefits. Uh, modeling Korea as, as perhaps something like a Germany right. in Northeast Asia. 
Um, it seems to me that one of the things that your piece really gets to is uh, that there is a legacy, a history of the Korean Peninsula unified, and that this period that we have had for six decades is, is actually an quite, anomaly. An yeah. anomaly. Yes. A, a, and a shocking one at right. that. And uh, that the cost has been tremendous. Yes. Um, and I think what you have also suggested both through the troop issue as, as well as a more general framework is that people will have to move into a different direction. Uh, what's been established over six decades has provided a foundation mm -hmm. for security and prosperity uh, and that the next stage of security and prosperity means some alteration of current arrangements and relationships, yes. China you mentioned. And so I guess I would ask you next, how do you see the other pinpoints in the year? The Bonanza, the speech in Dresden, the bilateral presidential summit with Xi Jinping in the summer as shifting the context for the South Korean public as well for as the international community. How do you see the stage as being set? And I think your piece actually is an important contribution to what's happened this year. Yes. Um, first of all, you're absolutely right. You have to remember that Korea has been united, unified, with one single country from 668 AD when Shila Dynasty, Shila Kingdom unified the country. Until 1945, it was one country. Through the colonial year, years, it's been one country. So from 1945 to now, that division is a very short blip in the history of in the Korean history. This is an anomaly that needs to be <laughs> fixed. Now, in terms of Preparation. I think President Park, it was very interesting to me that um, what, to be you know, candid, why South Korea now started this focus on unification. Um, mm -hmm. It coincided with my, I actually wrote the foreign affairs speech last year before the Dresden mm -hmm. speech, but um, it kept getting postponed. But I think it's probably because after Chang Song Tech's execution, it was, it, it really just made us, what my earlier point about, made us realize there's so much going on in North Korea we just don't know. Um, so I think there was that sort of shock of Chang Song Tech effect and that younger generation in Korea, particularly the younger generation, is moving away from this goal of unification, mm. right? Older generation, obviously, um, have some ties with North Korea. Many are from divided families. My entire paternal side came from North Korea. I lived through my personal whole histories. I was very close to my paternal grandparents um, who all came from North Korea. And they eventually passed away without ever finding out what happened to their moms and dads and uncles and aunts. And so I, I lived this divided family story. And, but the younger generation in Korea is moving away from it and because they're so fearful of the cost of the unification. They don't really have ties with North Korea. Who are these people? They could be people from another planet. They don't have, mm. no, right? So the younger generation is just, so I think um, the timing wise, it's just, there's a Chang Sung Tech's execution and the younger generation moving away from the unification. I think maybe, I can't speculate why Park government is, has been focused on unification, but I think they might have something to do with the mm. renewed focus, at least coming from the South Korean side. Um, and I think they're doing the right thing. I'm just, I, I know that South Korea is, um, right now promoting unification or talking a lot about it uh, with conferences and seminars and just different, they just have this new presidential committee on unification mm -hmm. to educate people um, on trying to get them to get at least, again, not be fearful about unification, but to get excited a little bit about the potential for, un for unification. To just say it's not going to be all bad. I just trying to really shift people's thinking a little bit on this mm -hmm. issue. What is some of the response that you've heard since the article was published in the July-August edition of yes. Foreign Affairs? Um, I got a mixed response. I got a, a lot of um, people wrote me, and they, they were very, very positive, and said it was good. And then there is, of course, um, you know, the Korea community is divided, and there are folks who uh, try to disagree with the piece. And um, I don't mean to point out Moon Jung in Professor Moon Jung in and John Delury, but they did write a, a response to this piece, which just came out in the latest Foreign Affairs. Right. So and this is the go November, and read that because it's 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 yeah. the other side of the argument. Um, and then I got an opportunity to write a rejoinder to that response. Mm -hmm. And I do believe I think I don't want to summarize 
I don't want to, because they, need, they will articulate this, their argument better, but I think the point is they're worried that I'm overly focusing on the opportunities. The piece was focusing on opportunities of unification and not enough on the challenges of the uh, unification. And that, that somehow I'm advocating a forceful change, a regime change. Um, so, but that's mm -hmm. the furthest thing from the truth because A, as I said, I'm, I'm not saying regime collapse is imminent. I don't know, I really don't. B, um, I, any kind of forceful change, that's not what I'm advocating. In fact, unification through force or war is the worst likely scenario. That's the last thing the world needs right now. So I'm not advocating that. Although, what I am saying is on balance, and again, as I said, I understand all the challenges that's going to, that unification will entail. But on balance, over the long term, I think um, there will be more benefits. And um, so I, I guess that's sort of the argument, is that the, is there, you know, what's stronger? Are there challenges, are there going to be more challenges than benefits, or benefits or challenges? Again, again, we don't have choice in the matter. Mm -hmm. um, it is what it is, and we have to sort of, um, I guess I'll go even further, I'll be very candid, I'll go further because what I secretly want is, is unification. And while I'm not advocating force for change, I am advocating because on balance it's going to, be not, uh, going to be better, A, let's not be fearful of it, and B, because if we're not going to be fearful of it, then we do what we can. And there are some things that we can do. We have very limited leverage, I get that. I mean, how can any outsider really affect make unification happen. But if you're not fearful of it, we can at least do what we can do, which is number one, I think we have to um, start by helping the North Korean people. Again, not enough focus on the people and what's going on the whole humanitarian side, mm -hmm. human rights perspective. Um, stepping up the information campaign, information penetration campaign, right? Um, trying to get outside information. Step up our efforts to get outside information into North Korea, to break down information blockade, Kim Jong-un's information blockade, highlighting regime's abuses, um, widespread systemic abuses, which the UN, on a 400-page you know, report this year, called crimes against humanity. Um, so in uh, you know, highlighting gulag and other human rights abuses. And I'm all, all about you know, economics. This is controversial, too. But continually step up our efforts to uh, pressure economically at the elite level, right? Um, economic sanctions and economic pressure to cut off the fund that Kim Jong-un uses to buy uh, luxury goods and luxury cars and cognac to continue um, getting support from the elite, elite support. So because if you're not fearful of unification, you will, we can do all these things while preparing for it by getting the region involved by really talking to the regional governments, and especially China, which we talked about, number one patron to Kim Jong-un. Mm. Let me close uh, our part of the discussion yeah. with uh, a question that sort of touches to some of the essential nature of this argument, and that is uh, one that you just alluded to in the first part of your answer to the desire for unification. Um, Often when I'm asked in classroom settings or in public presentations, what's one thing Americans don't really get or outsiders get about change on the Korean Peninsula, uh, I often respond that they don't understand the desire for unification. We often overlook that because of other concerns, so maybe important concerns, denuclearization, other issues. But that that is an essential part of Korean existence during this historical anomaly, yeah, okay. to use your words. And I know I was motivated to go into Korean studies, among other reasons, by standing near the DMZ and, and seeing elderly Koreans weep yeah. in, in their desire yeah. for, for what had been lost. Right. And I know that in advance of this discussion, uh, you know, one of our board members mentioned uh, you know, his generations, being the generation uh, that uh, dealt with the war years yeah. uh, as having so deeply desired and being concerned now that there may be a passing before that, that time comes. Could you say a few words in terms of your impressions of that essential desire for unification, especially coupled with what you opened with about the resoluteness of the Korean people, what they have built in a uh, matter of two generations, right. which is really um, a modern miracle in many ways. Right. 
Uh, and I would maybe add as another personal observation that I was so impressed in 1997 and 98 by seeing the resoluteness to the response to the international financial crisis. I spent a lot of time in Korea yeah. then, and I was uh, shocked and impressed by uh, how much Koreans contributed. And Grandmothers said, standing in line taking up their gold rings absolutely. and putting in the... And, and it said something yeah, to me right, about the resoluteness right. and what eventually would be a unification yeah. and integration period. Could you speak to that? Yes, no, absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I, my paternal grandparents helped raise me. I was very close to them because my father passed away when I was young, and you know, they, they helped raise me. And they were the lucky ones, right, because they happened to be in the southern part of the Korean Peninsula when the war broke out. And, but their families were not so lucky, right? Um, if there are other family members who remain trapped in North Korea, and as I mentioned, that they spent, I, that's all they talked about is what's going, what you know, trying to find out what happened to their family members. And I really, when I think about it, I, it's very personal to me. Mm. I, I truly, you know, sad at the fate of my family members and so many families, like my family, divided families, and actually all the North Korean people. I'm. All the North Korean people, I mean, they, I wish they had the kind of opportunities that I had, mm -hmm. or 50 million South Koreans have. These are the same people. I'm always shocked whenever I deal with North Korean defectors. They're like your cousin, your aunts, your uncles. They speak the same language. They are, it's the most ethnically homogeneous country in the world. They share the same culture, same history for so many years. And this anomaly, this is truly an anomaly. So why, well, okay, younger generation don't know it, fine. But this is really the responsibility of Korean people. Um, so all I can speak to is, let's not, let's, again, let's not fear it. It's, you have to believe in yourself. I do believe in the Korean people. You just mentioned just two, three decades. I was raised in the 60s, I, even 70s, Park jong era, and I came to the United States in the early 1980s. But I just remember, when I, now I go back to Korea, and I'm, I'm just shocked mm -hmm. at just the transformation the resoluteness and hardworking Korean people. So again, United Korea would have 75 million hardworking people. People talk, you know, a lot of naysayers talk about, oh, North Koreans are their indoctrination. It's going to be really hard for them to adjust. It's true with North Korean defectors. And I'm not underestimating some long-term consequences of trying to unite the two Koreas that have been separated now for 60 years. There's no other history, even German unification. East and West Germany where it's not so different not as different as Korea in terms of just separation, right? We've been separated for six decades uh, in terms of ideology and everything else. But again, um, I, do, I have to say, when you, if you just look at the historical record, South Koreans were able to do it. United Korea would be a bigger and better version of Co South Korea. It would be a whole Korea and f while freeing all the North Koreans, 25 million North Korean people. Dr. Sue Terry, thank you. Please a round of applause for Dr. Terry. Again, I'd like to thank our members of the board. I named a few before, but also to add Mark Gaston here, who has kindly spent his time today. Uh, and we appreciate so many members of the community who are working on these issues and issues like human rights. Uh, please do join us again next Friday at noon for our next installation and our series called The Analyst. And I'd invite you to please have a look at the gallery on your way out uh, at the current exhibition featuring items from Lee Snyder, our board member here today. And let me uh, just in closing say that if you haven't seen yesterday's Wall Street Journal, one of the recommended picks for New York for the weekend is the film series at the Museum of the Moving Image just about 10 minutes from here over the bridge. Uh, please have a look and uh, see our development team as well for membership at www.koreasociety.org. Thank you for coming today.